He is recording. All right, so. Okay, so. This is called the Stroop Effect. These are, the, I'm starting off with type tricks of the human mind. Okay. Does, for anybody, does this leave you confused? Okay. The um, words. I've done this before. Yes. Okay. You probably have. Okay. So the idea of our brain working, if you've ever, uh, there's a card game, I, don't, I must be called foul language or something, uh, where you pop, it, you pop out the cards and they're in different colors and there's different rules and your brain has to work very fast. So it's, it's that kind of idea that you're operating with. So color, which we've discussed, is absolutely imperative. Uh, and probably we noticed before we knew, noticed words because words uh, use a different part of our brain. And so we, okay. So if I ask you this one, what color is it? Okay, doesn't matter, we won't do the quiz, uh, but I think you can get the point of how it creates confusion. Wait a minute, that's not, your brain's like, instantly says blue, and the word says red, and you go, those two things don't match, so you notice. So here's some other ones. Take a look at that. Oh, yeah. This message um, serves to prove it's how our... Let everybody, let everybody read it. Don't read it out loud. Okay. You guys are probably used to it because you do numbers as words. What's this doctor? Huh? So can everybody read this? Let me see, I'll put my camera back. Yes. Okay. You guys are used to numbers replacing things, but these are actually nonsensical numbers. And, and part of what I'm trying to share with you here is that it has to do with, we actually see words visually. We don't, when we read, uh, once we know a language, when we read, we don't spell the words, we see the words. The words are very visual. So if the shape looks all right, we have a better chance of reading it. And even beyond that, we can also, And you guys actually are probably better at this. Uh, this is probably being able to do this might be impressive for someone who only speaks English. But since you guys read from, from right to left, okay. May, okay, I want to go back for a second because Maith has said the seven's a T. Yeah, you're right. It is a code. Things, things, yeah, okay. So three is the, okay, yeah, see, you even said, you were even breaking the code already. On this one, all right, like it says, it's incredibly pointless, but part of what it says is there are things you can do with typographic design that are very visual and people can read. So the next one is, okay.
Okay, so the idea is, is that we don't read all the letters. We read for context, we read for meaning. And here, Cambridge University Research. Actually, I'm thinking that we should, uh, that I should do a study, it'd be kind of fun to see if it also happens with Arabic. Because we do not spell words. I got into an argument once with a, with a dean. Maybe that's why they didn't offer me a job. Because uh, she thought how important it was to learn how to spell. It is important to learn how to spell. But as you can see, it is possible to overcome it because there are very few words in this paragraph that are spelled correctly. Uh, but one thing to think about when we think about those shapes, okay, words have a shape. And when part of the problem with using all capitals is in the age of social media, it does have the implication that you are shouting, but it also has the problem of making words into rectangles. So you actually, it, it is harder because you do actually see the letters. So when you read something that's in all capitals, part of the reason it feels like shouting or it's a more negative experience is because you have to work harder to read it. Whereas when things are in lowercase, they take on an actual shape. So the has a shape, the word shape. We have an H that goes up, a P that goes down, and of. So, so when we look at it, the words are able to take on more of their shape. A word like hippopotamus, you might not be able to spell it off the top of your head, but if you saw the word hippopotamus, you recognize it. Uh, Mississippi, uh, long words like that, they have a shape to them, they have a rhythm to them that's visual. And working in lowercase allows us to do more of that shape. I actually uh, very often try not to use capitals at all so that words do in fact have their shape. So if I take these two lines, now I don't know if this works, is, is the bottom one, easier to read than the top? Is, uh, could be easier because you've already read the top. But these even break up the shape, actually becomes sort of the length of the word, becomes that part of it that's very interesting. So when we think, uh, about okay when we think about how we shape okay if i if i do it now if i try to do it slowly and spell it throws me off even here it's more the distance of the words so even our brains can overcome that and read so let's talk about the importance of type, and even here, this nice little poster. Uh, I'm sure everybody, you can amazingly, if you if you look at it briefly, it looks like a mess. But once you start reading it, Any thoughts on this poster? Too hard to read? Not hard to read? Anybody still there? Type it in the chat window. It's just too crowded. But can you read it? Yes. Okay. It, Yes, uh, it is kind of messy, but ultimately it shows that there's a lot of ways you can read. Uh, if you don't sort of, if you just kind of try to glance over it, you're not going to be able to read it. 
because of the complexity, but it is possible once you sort of get into the visual rhythm of it. So when, so it's weird. Okay. So basically importance of pipe, pipe can be used sort of three different ways. One is very specifically communication of information. Uh, number two is in support of visual design. So it's in support of other elements within the design. And number three, it can be the center of a visual design. In the one we looked at, it communicates information and it really is the center of the visual design. So let me show you some examples. Okay, so this is actually incredibly old. This is from the 15th century. So as long as there have been a printing press, there's been type. Now, I know you can't read the language and actually the font itself is pretty complex. That's a, that's a black letter font and it makes us think of Germany and things like that. Uh, but that is printed words. We just can't read them because uh, I think it's in Latin. Okay, here's a book even that is written in French, but as you can see, basically the type is carrying all of the information and actually older books seem to have even smaller type than we have now, not always easy to read. So this is the idea of communicating the information. This is a classic broadsheet and this is very sort of fancy fonts, too many fonts. This one I would say also would fall into that messy category, but it is giving you a lot of information. And this was kind of, this is from the 19th century, the 1800s. Uh, a lot of it is when they developed these, this type and uh, some of them were woodcuts and things like that, but they use it. They just went crazy to try to attract your attention. Uh, not always the easiest to read. This is from, uh, 1923, I'm pretty sure. So this is uh, J. Walter Thompson, still a very big advertising firm. And this is explaining to people the importance of advertising. Uh, even in the, in the 20s, you wanted to be heard above the din and uproar the masses. So, uh, and, and the writing is even very sort of old style. When J. Walter Thompson Company makes a statement, it is hearkened to, it means it's listened to. Okay. So they think and speak for others. They started in 1864. And then even this is a magazine article. And, we, and it's pretty small, but you have some odd and sort of different text layouts, things like that, combining it with picture, but it is the words are carrying the information and the way they're set in the type is carrying that information. Uh, if it was just a picture of a bicycle, we might have a sense, uh, but this is a, a, a nice looking ad, but it's the words, it's the copy and how they're set. You can see there's a lot of space between the lines. Uh, there's a lot of white space. Uh, it follows the edges of the picture. Uh, we've got the little windows and tells you all the things come in for a test drive. Then it tells you who to call. That's a Chicago number, uh, West Erie Street, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, fun eight and a half months a year, healthy 10 and a half. Environmental friendly, 12. Okay, so th that's all communication of information. In fact, even something like a medicine container, a medicine box is designed and it thoughtfully uses typography so that you can read it very clearly, particularly when we're talking about medicine and things like that. It needs to be easily read. This is set up because when you fold it, it will all be in the right direction. But all this information is absolutely important. And so the letters need to be. Uh, and the words need to be written in a way that they're very clear and easy to read. Uh, even this, a magazine article, uh, article about Jody Foster, where they do a lot of sort of crazy things with the type, but it sort of sets them off as chunks. And it's not, it, this sort of emphasizes the design 
but it tells you all of her quotes and things like that. Uh, all right, so that's all the quotes. Now, it also operates in supported visual design. If you look here, you can see the shape of the letters. Follow the basic design, how this is designed. Uh, these letter forms actually would be specific to this. Now, in terms of color, I don't really like the bottom. That's too dark on too dark. It doesn't pop enough for me. Uh, you need to have this be lighter because you're going to say, you know, you see the America part and then it's much harder to read this because the letters aren't jumping off of the color. Okay. This is uh, another from the 1930s, uh, a sans serif font. We're going to talk about that. But it definitely feels the sort of visual style is also reflected in the words. So actually, in the 1930s, you could take uh, floating planes. Uh, there is actually a marine, uh, a marine air terminal in New York City uh, at LaGuardia, and this is Floyd Bennett Field. Uh, actually, I think that's down down in Queens and North Beach. Okay, obviously there was one Wall Street and 31st. Okay, so, and this is in LaGuardia's time, but a beautiful poster and the, the choice of font works exactly with the overall design. Okay, here it's in support of the design. Actually, the type becomes part of the picture. This is from a magazine. 1950s, really great design. Uh, uh, actually, it's an advertisement for it. Uh, it's an advertisement for a magazine. When you go out, you can see there's the magazine Women's Day. And it's a good photo, but the type is clearly completely integrated uh, into the image. Uh, this is where it's supporting the visual style. It's very active, not totally vertical. It's McCall patterns it's for making dresses and things like that. So it's fun, exciting, great use of color, but, and also it's a little odd, but it's readable. And it's, and the way the type is set is supporting the visual design. This is uh, called a Rebus, but this is the actual type setting of the M in the, uh, this was made by Paul Rand, but uh, IBM, and he actually designed that logo as well and made this poster, which is a classic, very cool, could be uh, inspirational, but this is words and pictures together for meaning. And then we look at, it, type can be the center of visual design, okay? And it actually, as you read it, it's, it is supporting what it says with a visual design. And it was actually in Kundalini today. Okay. This is actually a period. This is in Italian. And here, the type is in fact the design. Okay. Another one, this is from the 30s as well, where the type is set in a way to attract your attention, but the type is all of the visuals. There's a number of lines within it, but essentially it is a collection of words that if we spoke Russian uh, or kind of feels a little Polish or something might be Czech, uh, we can read it. This is also the words, the type, really beautiful uh, from the late 30s, early 40s. Thinking about actually it's very literalistic because that's how the shadows would come off of those letters. And that is not Photoshop. That is, these are all designed by hand, and they come from a time when designers actually put their names on their poster. You can see here, this is from 
a magazine. Uh, actually, it's an ad for Young and Rubicam advertising. Uh, and the weight of the word, and then the bending of the lines. It's great news. When is a heavy weight of advertising dollars bound to succeed? And when is tonnage bound to fail? All right. Uh, so there's actually no drawing, no photograph, anything. It is the use of type and words and the way the words are presented to create a design that we can definitely feel the weight of that word as it crushes the paragraphs below. Okay, this one very hard to read from the 1960s. And the type itself, it's obviously very hippy dippy. It's a poster for a band. It's San Francisco kind of style. We think of it in that era. Uh, the co color combination, not really pleasing to my eye, but and it's not overwhelmingly readable. But you have to focus on it, and it's about drawing you in. And then it's the the Hambers Brothers, and then it's March uh, twenty eighth. Uh, I, I can't even read it all. And the matrix is the theater and that's the address. And so that's even, but it is the visual design that it, the words are core to it. It's not supporting it, it is it. So there's even this, these are all words and they're making an image. And Okay. All right. So Okay, and we'll see this whole picture in a minute. See, I'm seeing on a really big screen. So when it, when you're really close to it, you actually see more of the words and when you get farther away then you can see the face the two eyes and the nose, and then the sort of line next to the nose and the cheek and then where the mouth would be and those sort of things. And then there are letters on the side that these collections of letters make letters. Okay, so let's talk about what is called the anatomy of type. So every, every font, every group family of, of letter forms have specific anatomy and certain things we look at in them that tell us about those about that type family and even that type category so the number one thing is we always talk about uppercase and lowercase the first uh letters designed for uh, in English were actually uh, what we call the capital letters or the uppercase. And then lowercase was devised, unsealed uh, afterwards. But the reason they're called uppercase and lowercase is that is that in when a person was setting type, the capital letters would be in the uppercase and the unsealed or the lower, the small letters would be in the lowercase. So that's, it's a very practical thing is why they're called uppercase and lowercase. Uh, and it's the actual technical name is capitals and unsealed. So that's just a tradition thing. So these letters are grouped together and these letters are grouped together. So then we can look at aspects of these letters. So there is something, this is called the cap height, which is what we can see. Remember I showed you two thirds, okay? But we have the capital height, which is how tall is the capitals, are the capitals. 
then every all these different parts of the letter have a name that the key ones for us are ascenders okay are wait i'm going to go to another one but this is here for you to look at the baseline is for every is any font will have will have a baseline going to this top to this top line will be the capital height okay so this is the line above it is the ascender lines and every letter that has these attributes every capital will go to this line every letter will have this as the baseline and that is how the whole font will be built around different fonts will have different lengths of ascenders uh we'll see in a minute this is actually called the x height uh there's all kinds of crazy different ways the access of a letter is how is its tension what's the direction of it and those sorts of things so if we look so this is wait this shows you the x height and that's how tall how short are is the middle part of the letter. It is based on the letter X. Okay. Then these are serifs out on the ends of the words. And here we'll we'll look at this next one. Then in black, we'll show it to us all in one place. Okay. So all of these different parts of letters, like on a G, it's called an ear. Okay, if we look here. We have the ascent line, which is how high do the ascenders go. We have the cap line, which or the capital, and that's the capital height is from the baseline to the capital. There's the mean line or the X line or the X height, and that is this is the height of the unsealed, the lowercase letters of the main part of the letter. Then we have the descent line. So at the ascent line, we have ascenders. At the descent line, we have descenders. Uh, there's ascenders there, showing you it's above this X height. Okay. And then actually, the, the widest letter is an M. And that uh, shows you the widest a letter will be uh, in terms of horizontally. Uh, we have, it's just, it's massively broken down into these different chunks. So we can see there, there's serifs. Okay, there's serifs. And then this is the ear. This is the bowl. And this shows you the stress. Okay, the stress line is very important within different categories of fonts. So, it's not like you have to memorize this, but if you have some of these things down, it gives you a vocabulary so that you can talk about how different letters are shaped differently, how different letters operate differently. Uh, also important is the stroke. How wide is the stroke? How even is the stroke? Um, I'm, I'm curious if anybody, if you write in the chat, uh, do any of you guys do calligraphy with Arabic and things like that? Because the Arabic fonts actually work the same way. Uh, okay, yeah, to be done very well. And actually, Arabic Arabic letters are much more uh, graphically useful because you guys can read them in a whole bunch of different ways. Okay. But even these come from, these naming of these parts come from uh, calligraphy. And that's how they're treated. So those are serifs, those are serifs. So let's apply some anatomy to the most important things. Uh, I, this will be up there and available. Okay, so there are, I've identified eight styles of type and the reason it's important to understand something about the styles of type is we'll see after i go through some of these styles that 
This helps you how to understand how to combine them. Uh, I've included black letter really because it is the original, the oldest. This is a fairly modern version of a black letter, but it's based, it's, it looks very German when you see it. Uh, it is very equal. Actually, if we looked at this font here, this is called Fleisch Wolf, and it's actually available in Adobe. Okay. But it's based on these triangles and hexagons, and you put them together to create these letters. Uh, it's some of the first printed works are printed in, in this style of type, not this exact one. Uh, and so that's why it's here. You can see here, see the, the descenders, very short, the ascenders, very short, the, the X height. Okay, so, the, so these look, I guess you need to see me maybe. Okay, so these look pretty stumpy. Uh, and so these have a very, their, their bodies are thick, it's very heavy. Uh, and as I've said, it's very German, but this is a very specialized type. You would have to be doing something that fits with this. This is like heavy metal bands, things like that. Uh, things that sort of border on a Nazi vibe as far as I can tell. But black letter does have history. It, it was taken from somewhere historical when it was used in that way. So that's black letter, that's a style. Another style is Roman and it is based on the original capital letters. Uh, anybody know why the brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and why I care? Sorry, Professor, we didn't hear you. I didn't hear your question. Huh? Sorry, say again, Nor. I didn't hear your question. Oh, you didn't hear the question. So, uh, why why this phrase? Uh, it's usually the quick brown fox, but that's sort of redundant. So I just have quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Okay. Uh, no answer to this. Okay. It contains all the letters in the English alphabet. Uh, that's why. No way. The, tw the 26 or 28. Okay. Now, see, now you're going to force me to show it to you. Okay. So I'll show it to you. Let me get my chat window on. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, no N, but N it is in the brown N. It is, sorry, N, bunch of O's, uh, P, Q is a hard letter to get in there, uh, Q, R, uh, S is going to S, uh, T, wait a minute, U, C, so Q and U, you get uh, uh, V, over, over, yeah, thanks, V, W, X, for Y, Fox is there, another hard letter to get in there, uh, Y, Z, so there's, uh, the whole alphabet. So when you look at it, you can see the entire font. Okay. So what, as you look at this, what is to be noticed about it? 
Now, this is the font that is very readable. Uh, it is like the second oldest font. Sometimes there's an old style and something called transitional, uh, but I've grouped the two together. But what you can see is the letter. So the letters that have straight stems all have a serif. That, that serif is in fact a diagonal. It's called the diagonal serif because it reaches out to it. It is, the serifs are meant to act kind of like calligraphy to, to connect you to the letters next door. So, so the diagonal serif is a clear part of this style. Okay. Next, that's a clear part is that the stroke itself goes from me, it, it's medium thick to medium thin. Okay, so that is very much like calligraphy. That's that's a replication. Like we go to the bottom of the J here. And if you if you've done calligraphy, you hold the brush, and how you hold the brush sets the width of the, it, that's the stroke. But then when you turn it, you don't turn the brush. If you turn the brush, the width could stay the same. But if you're, you, what to me distinguishes calligraphy uh, and both Arabic and actually Chinese involve a lot of calligraphy uh, when it's done well, okay? Not so much English, but people do it with calligraphy to look nice. But you hold the brush the same way and you turn the corner. So that's what that creates the thinning of the stroke, okay? And the O tells us where this, okay? So the O tells us the direction of the stress, which if we look to the capital O, it's very vertical. It's pretty vertical here. It's just a touch diagonal, but what distinguishes this is this, and the difference between the thick part of the letter and the thin part of the letter is called the stress. So this is a medium stress, and you're gonna see in the next one what high stress looks like. Okay, so this there is a difference in the stroke. There's stress in the stroke where there's thick and thin parts. Okay, for here, where sort of the U, you would go down and you would end up and it sort of goes up. So it's serifs, it is stroke, it is stress in the stroke, it is the direction of stress, slightly diagonal in lowercase and vertical in the uppercase, okay? And then what distinguishes one Roman from another is gonna be the ascenders and the descent, the ascenders, sorry, and the descenders, the X height and even the cap height. Uh, a couple of the letters that I always look to that really tell me about whether I like a font or not. Okay. G's are very interesting to me and they can change a lot from one font to the other. I like these. I call this a very old school G because it's got the bowl and everything down on the bottom. Uh, other G's can just be the straight one, but I like this sort of classic Roman. This Roman, most newspapers, anything that's meant for a lot of reading, a book, anything like that is set in a Roman. So it uses a Roman font and there are variations on these. Uh, some of them are subtle, but the difference between Times New Roman and Times, uh, actually what's interesting about that, if you wanna know, that it's readable. The font was actually created for the New York Times. Okay, so that's why it's called the Times. They created it to set their newspaper in this print so you can read it. And you can read this down to very small sizes, particularly in printing. Okay, so that's sort of the base one we start with is Roman. Next, we look at a modern which is also readable, but I think you can see here because I, I talked about it already, okay? 
is that a modern has high stress. So you can see there's a huge difference between the thick and thin. This is absolutely vertical, very thin. And it is called a modern because these don't appear till a couple centuries after, literally 200 years, because the technology allowed type to be made that was super thin like this. The other one, the, the Roman we looked at, there's, it appears there's thinness here, but it's not even close to the thinness we see in a modern. This one's actually called Dido, which is a very famous one. Also what you see is that the serifs, there are serifs, but they are flat serifs, okay? There's no diagonal connecting it. This is more modern. It's a little more mechanical. It's not, it, it gives some homage to calligraphy, but less so. This is also very readable, but it's not quite as comfortable. It makes for, a, it, it's actually very classy, very upscale kind of feel to it because of the thick and the thin. So this was created possible, the possibility was created by technology. So you can see the thick and the thin. Uh, this particular one has, a, has more space in the sender and descender. It seems lighter, okay? These actually are the same uh, point size, but we're not really going to go into that too much. So they do, that's not an absolute sort of measure, but you can see here that that's what distinguishes a modern. You look at the S, very small. The O really, and the, the, stress, the stress is high and the stress line is vertical. Vertical. In the G, vertical. Okay, in all the round shapes in the queue. Uh, I was telling you I like G's. Okay, so the G tells me a lot about the font. Actually, the J and the I tell me a lot about the font. And I also like A's. So if we look at either one of these A's, they do have the top on them. Okay, a much more sort of old style kind of A. And then Q's tell me something in capitals. And because my name starts with R, I look at the R's. This one's a little awkward for me. See this I like, this kind of holds up because the R is a little off balance anyway. It's a P with an added angle to it. So that's a modern. So that's different showing the modern. This is called an Egyptian or it's called a slab serif. Oh shoot. I didn't put I didn't put the name of the font on here. Uh, and now I'm not remembering. Courier is a slab, Sarah. Uh, but okay, so the distinction is that the serifs themselves are very square. They're slabs. They're very heavy. Okay, and we also move toward if you look at the strokes. There's very little stress in the strokes. There's still something organic. And then we see the slab. Uh, this is not Courier. Courier actually has, which is something you'll find in your computer really quickly, has a rounded, the slabs are more rounded. And so this one starts, you can see it's very even. It's losing all connection to calligraphy. I mean, the serifs are there to connect the letters, so you can see where the U goes to the M, okay? But they are very square. You can see there in the O, there's pretty much, this one has virtually no stress at all. It's very regular, okay? There's no thin part to it. All of the stroke elements are very much similar. Uh, this part of the E, which has a technical name, this part of the E, is a little bit smaller than the rest of the stroke. Uh, and this is more the other kind of G with just uh, the bottom part. That kind of looks like a dog. Uh, I like this Q, the way it works, but Egyptians are slab serifs. There were the period if we, uh, a, there was in the early 1800s and things like that, the, and they started doing woodcuts. They made these huge serifs. It was 
uh, very much sort of these uh, a classical sort of look. But you can see here that okay, stress is even. This particular one has smaller ascenders and descenders. The core is in the X height. Uh, you can see that the capital height is taller, but I'm sure actually the ascender line and the capital line are very close to one another. Okay, so this is when you see the these slab serif, it is reasonably readable. And uh, but for me, it's a little clunky, and it is not as readable as some others. But oh, that's what it actually looks like. Sorry, is an old school typewriter. It has an old school typewriter feel to it. So that's if that's what you're trying for. If that's the look you want it to feel, that's when you use an Egyptian or a slab serif. I don't know why it's called Egyptian. Actually. Uh, then we go to humanist. Okay, this is this is Gil Sands. It's a humanist. And what a humanist is, it is sans serif, or in Latin, without serif. Let me see. Okay. So you can see there's no serif at all. These are highly beloved in computers. You can see no serif. You can see, okay. Virtually no stress. There's no stress. The stroke is completely even. So you could say it's vertical, but it doesn't really matter. There's no stress. So there's no lines of the stress. Now, I'm going to show you humanist, which is Gil Sands. This is the sans serif. Sometimes it's called grotesque. Sometimes it's called gothic. I don't have any idea why it's called gothic. But uh, if you see something that's called grotesque, uh, it sounds kind of insulting to me, but maybe it's not. But you can see here, no serif. And so that's a humanist. And on the other side is a geometric, which is stuff that shares almost the same attributes. But in a geometric, the O appears to be perfectly round. The, it has a geometric has lost all sense of calligraphy. There is still, if we look at CDR and the, the, this stroke, there's a, there is a little bit of transition to it. There is a little bit of stress in there, the thick and the thin. If we look at the M, sort of those curves, there is some homage to its history, even in this, in the G. When we go to a geometric, it is all absolutely even. We look at the M, Okay, very little change. We look at the R, okay, geometrics, and this is Futura. Uh, and uh, Futura and Century Gothic are the, the two I use. I use Century Gothic a little more than Futura, but Futura is absolutely geometric. And computers like these, these are actually also very readable. Less so printed, more so on a screen. These are very strong on a screen. So if you're looking for something to read that's printed or intends to be printed, that, okay, a Roman is the most readable. Uh, also very readable. Egyptians are a little less. And then humanist and geometric are more for screens. You, you can read them printed, uh, you see them less, but in terms of screens, these are very often used. Okay, so that's a geometric and this is Futura. Uh, now, there, I've created a whole, uh, uh, the whole category of script. We worked through this when we were doing the poster, we looked at script, but script essentially is, looks like handwriting. Okay, you can see, uh, this is called Cocktail Shaker. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I can have a favorite, but it doesn't mean that I'm able to use it. The style you choose needs to fit into 
what you're trying to say in the ad, in the poster, in whatever the, the wherever the text is being used. It needs to it needs to connect with that design. So here it looks nice, but this it will ultimately be harder to read and creates more stress for the reader. Okay. Uh, but using it for a title, awesome. And we'll look at that a little bit in a minute. Okay. So this is uh, a recent one that I downloaded uh, called Coffee Service. And it's, it kind of looks like what you'd see in a coffee shop. Definite. Okay. As the script look, uh, actually. So that's another script. Uh, you will find much greater difference in scripts, handwritten and, and uh, decoratives than you find in the other categories. The other categories, the other styles, you will see them stay, they will, you will sort of see that they share a style. So there's coffee service, here's swing bowl. It's another one of, I like, but I don't get to use it very much. Now I'm not good at handwriting, cursive writing. This is cursive writing. Uh, so I tend toward hand style, handwritten style, which is printing. So these, it's interesting because these do actually hark back to being more human. If we go to geometric is the most non-organic. It is the most mechanical. Uh, it is what the Louvre Abu Dhabi is in. I think a, uh, a geometric, it could possibly be humanist. Okay. But these two, and especially this one, are very machine oriented, very manufactured. So they, it's actually forgotten all of its connection to the to actual handwriting. And, and whereas when we go to script, it is screaming out, this was written by a person, but it's written exactly the same every time. So it was written by one person. I really don't like the size of those dots on the eyes. It's, it's bothering me right now. Okay, so here, those dots look a little better with the size of the type. So we go to handwritten. You can see it's rougher around the edges. It looks like it's written. This is called the Vera. Uh, this is more how I write. So this, I tend to use handwritten, hand style. Uh, then I do the others. This is Bradley. It's a little thinner. Okay, but it is the divided letters. It's not connecting them by script. Okay, this is called swing set. Kind of fun. Okay, I like the once again, looking at the G, I like the G. But now with these, they are consistent within themselves, but it's a little harder to apply the anatomy of type, but we still get a sense of there's an X height, but what you can see is each one of these letters is actually not even within those lines of the X height, or it's not even within the line. They're, they don't follow, there it is. They don't follow a straight baseline. So that's part of how they're more organic. This one follows a straight baseline. This one, straight baseline. So it's following. If you look at the rules, there's a definitive height to the lowercase letters, the ascenders. Okay, very regular. But some of them can get to the point of looking like this. And part of what makes it feel more organic is the fact that it's not following those structures. So the W will always be in the same place. Uh, the Q is pushed way up and the U, okay? But they're not, it's not a straight line going on here. So this becomes more, uh, it gives it more of an organic feel like it. It's not machine created uh, in any way, whether a digital machine or an analog machine of some kind. So then we go to decorative fonts. Decorative fonts, this is Bachlin, Bachlin's universe. It's very Paris. 
uh, it's very Art Nouveau. It's very 18th, turn of the 18th to the 19th century. Uh, actually, more than Paris, this is Prague. This screams out Prague. Okay. So there it's following the rules, but it has its own distinctive style. Uh, it's got, if you look at it, it has serif, so it's got that homage, but then it's got a lot more stylish sort of flares. That's what decorative is. It's, it's more themed, uh, structured in that way. This, this is kind of painted, but it's very much, it's about the style and what it evokes. This, okay, this is Grobold, which is one of my favorites. Unfortunately, it only comes in one size. I wish he made more sizes. Uh, I do need to pay him because I use it all the time and I love it, but it feels more comic book. Okay, this is like the printing in a comic book. You can see you've got the circle on the G with the little ears. It, it's fun. I like it in the way the Q and his J has a curve. His Q is more traditional to me. Uh, it's very thick, it's very heavy. Uh, would be cool if there were some more varieties of it, but I like it for titles. You wouldn't put a whole lot of text in this. It's too heavy. It makes it requires too much work to work through. So this is Jambo. This is just kind of fun. Actually, to me, this feels like Mary Poppins. Uh, if you think of, like, if we think of decorative, actually, you can think of movie posters where they design a font to name that movie, and this one feels like that. And then uh, this is one that actually I created, uh, and. It feels slightly East Asian Chinese to me. It's got a little of the flavor of Art Nouveau, of Bachlan, et cetera. It does have a regularity. Uh, I definitely didn't design this perfectly, so it's not completely even. It was my first go. The Y still bothers me, and actually, I'm not too sure if that's a J. But, uh, and the dog's not my, okay. So those are styles of type. So within a style of type, you will have weights, different weights. So you'll go, this is from ultra thin to actually extra black. So the ones you see all the time, you see regular, you see thin, you see bold. Uh, actually, yeah, this is extra bold, okay? Which is, this is bold, this is regular, this is extra thin, and this is thin. And so they have different weights, different thicknesses. And this is best accomplished actually by a type designer and not by the computer like you do in Microsoft Word and you make something bold. It is a different font. You do have to choose it. In some fonts, the letter forms will change. This is clearly, okay, this is, wait, I'll look at it in regular. We'll tell me more about it. Okay, this is a humanist font, okay? And so you see that. And then on top of weight, we also have italics. Italics is a small lean, uh, used mostly only for emphasis. And this is actually a place as it gets thicker, things change. But I don't use italics very often. Uh, if you sort of start using it, it's something you kind of stay with. Uh, italics are a little bit like all caps, and they attract quite a bit of attention, and that's the intention. But when I think of it, I think of titles and things like that. So that's italics. Um, and actually, with these two I've shown you, those are each individual fonts. You would have to select different ones and it's doubled up. So that actually represents uh, one, two, uh, 10 different types of one font that has a particular style. So then uh, functions of type. So we can talk about display title. You can use any font for a title, make it bigger, use a thicker form of it. I mean, this is a super crazy decorative one, making English letters try to look like Arabic, uh, et cetera. This is more old school. This is, this is looking 
uh, a little more comic book, et cetera. So you can kind of see this is a little more turn of the century, but this is just a plain, very straightforward font, uh, et cetera. So title fonts, the what you choose is definitely based on the style, the, the what you're trying to say in what you've made. So like in your lexicon, this would be the title things. This would not be the regular things you read. This could be the titles on the different ones. And the other thing I want to emphasize a little bit to you is the fact that, that these kind of varieties also exist in Arabic type. Uh, I didn't get to that and since it mostly confuses me, but there are a lot of different fun sorts of Arabic fonts that you can use. You don't have to use the one that it gives you. You can use different ones and make more of a statement, be more creative, etc. So, uh, okay. So this is showing you text. This is too much. Okay. This is much more of a title style font. Uh, actually, uh, it is this one. Okay. Which looks great in a title, but if you have to read a lot of it, that's hard work. Okay. So if we look here, you can see here's a Roman. Okay, these are nonsense words, so don't worry that you can't read them. Okay. Uh, lorem, lorem ipsum delor. Okay, is the standard nonsense text. Okay, it doesn't even need anything in Latin. It's, it's nonsense. Okay, so that you look at the form. So this is a Roman. This is a, sorry, this is a humanist. It has some weight, some thickness, and then this is geometric. This is actually century Gothic, something I use quite a bit. And these are much more readable. They're much more appropriate for text. So title, you could use anything. For a title, you do want it to be able to be read. Uh, you might go with something a little bit this crazy, not always easy to read, but you would not put the text, the stuff we're supposed to read in that same kind of font. It makes it much harder to read. And when you go beyond one line, it becomes extremely difficult to read. And if it's over long passages, this is definitely the strongest places with the Roman. And then we can also see these. So one of the other keys about uh, mixing fonts is, okay, uh, I've got this chart on here that tells you what to mix. But if we look at mixing fonts, okay, so I've used category instead of style here. I'll change that. Okay, so you don't ever do a different font in the same style. That looks wrong. It is wrong. Don't do it. It looks like a mistake. People will see it. They won't necessarily know why. They'll go, this doesn't look right. Because if they're in the same category, if they're the same style, okay, if they're the same style, then it's going to look wrong. Don't do a Roman with a modern, okay, because that's virtually the same. Okay, they're very they're similar enough that all of a sudden somebody says, why are the, the letters all of a sudden? get so much stress or have so much thinness they didn't have it before. Don't ever mix them, okay? Don't mix humanist and geometric. It will look wrong. They are too similar, okay? Do same font, different weights, okay? Uh, Doctor? Uh, yeah. And I have a question. Uh, uh -huh. the, there is one professor once said, I don't remember who actually, but I remember that uh they said that uh, he said that um we don't use all caps uh caps in a, in, in a word like it's better to make the word bigger but we don't use all caps is that right oh, like we don't well, put it all you, in uppercase if you yeah all uppercase yeah if you're doing it in a title it might be okay if, if that's what fits. I mean, there are fonts that are all caps. There are fonts 
that are totally meant to be tidal. So you could do it. Actually, there's also good fonts with small caps where the lowercase is not actually smaller letters, but it's capital letters, but they're in a smaller form made to work with the larger capitals. So with a title, you can't have specifically that rule, but in text, I would say don't use all caps unless you have a very specific reason. If you wanted to jump off the page and shout, okay? And that's, that's a very modern interpretation of all caps. But with email, with, you know, uh, things like that, the reason older people use all caps is it was sort of, it was a way they emphasize things. But now it's come to mean like it's shouting and aggressive. Okay? So in a body of text, if you want to draw attention to that word, all caps is a way to do it. Okay? Uh, uh, italic is a more uh, subtle way to do it. And it will attract attention to it because it's different. But you could totally change the font of that word. So that's why I'm saying I'm giving you these, these ideas of changing fonts. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes. OK. So OK. So, doctor, so you're saying I'll, that. Uh, yeah. uh, the, doctor, so you're saying that we can mix between two fonts yeah because i got lost in track Mi mixing what now what mixing Sorry. fonts yeah yeah and and that's why i'm giving these rules okay because it's actually a good thing it it, it is more fun if you do a certain title you're and if it's really crazy and fun and and sort of creative then the, uh, the text shouldn't be in that same font. So this kind of gives the idea that you can, uh, so you can do Romans with Egyptians, moderns with Egyptians, Romans with sans serifs, moderns with sans serifs. Okay, they are different enough. They are, when something, okay, so contrast, 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 if it looks like a mistake, it is a mistake, you need them to be different. Different is good and so different. Go big or go home. So, doctor, um, like we have the old style, the modern, the script, the sound serves, the uh, stab serve. Um, is it fine to choose between the same, like from two fonts from the same category, or is it better to use two fonts from different categories? Two fonts from different categories. Don't do different fonts in the same category it will look wrong. And I would say any time is also not to go insane like that railroad poster and use every font under the sun just because you can. Because Doctor, you can, it's easy. Yeah? I have a file uh, that, that we used to do it in Come to 12. Um, it says the categories of each and every um, possible fonts that we have in Illustrator. Can I share it so you can see? Okay. Okay, so here, this is the old style. And then the modern, the slab serve, the script, the sans serve. So I can mix between, like, let's say, Times the New Roman with uh, the sign part painter, yeah? Yeah, that's let's interesting say. because it's not right. It's, it's, not, it's right. not right? No, it's not right. Because American typewriter is not an old style. And that should be castle on. But uh, so I call old style, I call them Romans. Uh, okay, Dido. Yeah, Baskerville. All right. But slab serifs. Okay, Clarendon is not a slab serif. Ariel is not a slab serif. It's sans serif. Impact is not a slab serif. There's no serif. Krungfep has no 
Okay. Uh, so clearly, yeah, it's okay, sorry. Script, yeah, obviously, scripts look, and then decorative. Uh, I separated script in hand, but this lab serif category is not right. Uh, and I hate this spelling. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it does give you some differences. These definitely can go with those. These can go with those. But American typewriter is actually a uh, slab serif. It, it's, I can't see here. Maybe, maybe it's less so. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's the way to do it. And, okay. and see, even Trajan, Trajan is the original Roman uppercase letter forms. So it actually is Roman. It's, it's, uh, it's just all caps, but okay, sorry. I'm a, I'm a bit more of a geek on it. Okay. So, sorry. So it's like from different, uh, yeah, I use from I different categories. Instead. Huh? Who, who gave you that? No, we did it and come to 12. Did the teacher give it to you? No, no, no. Oh, so it oh, was a kind okay. of a category. It, uh, it was a kind of uh, an activity, but he he haven't okay. mentioned that it was wrong. Okay. So I thought it was the right. Teacher, no, you, okay, but okay, that's why you that's why you limit the number of things you use. Okay, so I'm going to upload this presentation because there is. A little, there is some more to it. I do realize it's 922. Uh, I can clearly talk forever. Uh, because there, there is more here uh, showing you actually some combinations. This is a, a bunch. You don't even, you can sort of see if you know the styles, you can see they go together. So it's some nice combinations. This is that picture. Uh, from farther away, basically all built out of letters. Uh, and then the text and color really is thinking about when we talked about color, if you remember this slide from before, uh, legibility, uh, we could go back to those other pictures and actually look at those pictures. The, the one on Montana, not a good combination. Don't do dark colors together, all sorts of things like that. You need it to be legible, readable, and then I can go through this uh, on Illustrator at a different point, but uh, we'll put that in. So right now, I'm hoping that this will help you, sorry, I'm hoping this will help you with your lexicons. And uh, I did see a number of other people come in. So, all right, so that's it for now. Thanks. Uh, as soon as it's available, I'll put it up so you can look through. But also, I will, I'll put up, I'll probably have to make them smaller, but I will put up the uh, PowerPoint so you can see and see the different styles. And I'll make a couple of the corrections that I need to make. Okay. Thanks, everybody. There. Yeah. Did you take attendance? Yes, I did. So I'm here.